Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today online to speak to you about integrative modeling of <clears throat> biomolecular complexes. Uh, so I'm Alexandre Bonvin, I'm based at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, and my group is developing, uh, among others, the, the Haddock software. So this is the topic for the next hour. And then we'll move into a tutorial slash a demonstration of uh, what you can do, or at least a little bit small aspect of what you can do using Haddock. So I'm going to give you first a general introduction on the topic of biomolecular interactions. Then I'm going to explain to you uh, what Haddock is, what distinguishes it from other software in the field, which is the use of information to really drive the modeling process. And I will illustrate that with a number of different application examples ranging from macromolecular complexes, protein, protein to small molecular complexes and finish with some conclusions. So biomolecular interactions are, are crucial to life. They are everywhere. We're all aware of all the genomic information which encodes for the proteins, which are the, the main actor of life. But proteins are uh, playing their function by interacting with other molecules. So if you want to understand, uh, so here we have the genome, the express protein will give you the proteome. And if you go to the next level of organization, you have the interactome, which is the network of all interactions in a given cell. And proteins are the main players in this uh, interactome. So if you want to understand how things work at a molecular level, structure is not only uh, say required, but also you need to shed light on the interaction that those structure uh, make. So it means studying complexes, complexes between biomolecules, because changes in structure, but also changes in the network in those interactions can be the origin of disease. Simple mutations can, can distort this network. Um, you might want to engineer molecule to create beta materials or food applications. Uh, and of course, drug design, which is one of the topic of, of today, uh, to, to do drug design or structure-based drug design, you need access to, to structure. And if you want to module actions with drugs. So this brings me to the structural biology of interactions, where you see here on the <clears throat> right side, uh, more the experimental side of things. And on the left side, you will see the computational things, uh, part of things. And we have here the different experimental techniques with X-ray crystallography, NMR, and cryo-electron microscopy uh, being the three uh, key methods to get access to structural information of uh, or structures of, of biomolecules, X-ray being the oldest one, NMR having uh, working mainly in solutions or in solid state, but also adding a lot of information about dynamics of molecule and cryo-EM really the, the star these days in structural biology, which is uh, producing amazing uh, structures of complexes. So these three will give you access to say the full structure of a complex, but next to those key uh, methods, you also have a lot of experimental methods and this is by no means an extensive list, but you have other experimental methods that are giving you pieces of the puzzles. So mass spectrometry these days is, is, has moved into say stru structural methods for structural biology, you can measure uh, detect crosslinks between molecules, and those crosslinks provide you distances between molecules. They might not be sufficient to solve fully from the data uh, the structure of the complexes, but they provide you pieces of information. The same apply, for example, to scattering methods like X-ray scattering, small angle X-ray scattering, or neutron scattering, which provide you information about shapes of molecule, but not the atomistic details. So if you can combine this type of information when you cannot solve the structure from scratch, together with computational method, you can move into, you can characterize interactions as well. So we are moving from the experimental to the computational. And here there are different ways of uh, looking at structure of complexes. Uh, so you can do it by homology modeling if there is a homologous structure of the complex in a protein database. But if you look into the PDB, you will realize that there are much less structures of complexes in the PDB than components. Um, 
You can run, try to predict interactions by molecular dynamics, but predicting, say, protein macromolecular assemblies association is, uh, is very challenging and uh, will require a lot of computing. And uh, not so much has been done. And of course, in the context of today's lecture, docking uh, is the method of choice. I should also add here uh, AlphaFold to Google DeepMind, which has uh, brought a revolution in the field of, say, computational structural biology. Um, it was developed to predict structures of, say, single proteins, but you see now uh, there's a lot of developments where AlphaFold 2 is also being looked into to predict structure of complexes. You will find preprints on bioarchives talking about protein peptide modeling using AlphaFold. You also find some papers now using, uh, say, classical docking methods and, um, and AlphaFold 2. So there, there's a lot of things are going to happen in a, in a very near future. But for today, we're going to concentrate on docking as a method to generate 3D models of biomolecular complexes. So molecular docking in a nutshell. So given the structure of uh, the component of the complex, and in this case, we see a binary complex, two proteins, can we predict how those associate? Uh, so this requires searching a six-dimensional space if the molecule are considered rigid because you can fix one molecule at the origin of your coordinate system. And what you have to do with the second molecule is to sample all possible rotations. So in 3D will be three axis and all possible translation around the first molecule. Again, three uh, dimensions. So six dimensional problem for two molecules. Of course, many complexes consist of more than two molecules. So you also need to be able to, to model larger assemblies. And not all software out there, docking software, can handle more than two molecules. So this is not so simple as it, as it looks like. There are, of course, uh, other challenges that come into play because you have to uh, add flexibility to those systems. Uh, flexibility is an intrinsic properties of biomolecules and often associated with their function. So, so the dimensionality of the search problem is much larger than a six dimensional one. Now, what do those docking methods usually uh, consider in doing those predictions? So you're going to sample a lot of possible solutions and then you have to decide which ones are the good one and which ones are the bad one. Uh, the most, uh, say, say the oldest way of, of doing this uh, discrimination game will, uh, was to, to use the shape complementarity of the molecule. So you want to, to measure how well those two molecules fit on top of each other. Uh, this will be more like geometric consideration for scoring, but you can also use classical energy terms like electrostatic, of course, an important part of interactions and biomolecular recognitions, van der Waals energies. And if you have data, you might also use data as a way of scoring those models. So docking consists basically of, of, of two parts. The first part is the sampling. So you need a strategy to generate a lot of different models of your complexes. And I just told you, you have a six dimensional search problem. So you have some kind of interaction landscape. You have to sample this landscape. You have to generate a lot of different models, ideally to sample the entire landscape. If you do say ab initio uh, modeling and associated with this landscape is some kind of function energy function that's going to hopefully distinguish what is a good prediction that should be here at the bottom of this energy well from a bad prediction. So this is the sampling. The sampling, and then the second phase is the scoring. So the scoring is basically associating a score, some energetic value uh, to each of those models and selecting what should be the, the correct solution. Uh, the two are often uh, tightly connected depending on the choice that you make on sampling, uh, this has implication on scoring and vice versa. And these days you also see a lot of uh, machine learning, deep learning models uh, coming out to, to help this uh, scoring uh, problem. Not so much the sampling yet, but that's bound to come as well. Now, if you have data, and this can be external data, experimental data, like the, some of the methods that I just mentioned, but this could also be bioinformatic predictions. This could be coevolution information, which is also uh, used by methods like AlphaFold2 and many other prediction methods. So if you can predict contact between molecules, this is a very valuable information that you can use to, to bias the sampling possibly or bias the scoring. So you can use the data in two ways. 
And this brings us basically to integrative modeling of the, of the use of data, the integration of data during the sampling phase. So if you don't use the data for the sampling, you're going to do a global search. So you have to sample the entire space, generating lots of models. If you use the data to drive the search, you're going to focus your sampling in a given region of space defined by the data. And hopefully you can locate easier the global minimum of this landscape. But this also comes with uh, some dangers because if your data are wrong or if you have bad data, false positive information, you might search in the wrong region of space and never find the right answer. So, so you have to be able to deal with uh, errors in the data and you have to be able to, to assess the reliability of your, of your data. So, so this has advantage, but this also comes with dangers. There's no free lunch. So when we speak of integrative modeling, generally in a, in a field, we, we speak of the combination of different sources of data. And you see a number of experimental techniques uh, or actually information sources to, to model complexes. I mentioned mass spectrometry, cross-linking. Uh, you can do HD exchange experiments that allow you to identify binding interfaces. You can measure some kind of distances between molecules by all kinds of different methods, cross-linking MS being one of them. You can measure orientation. This will be more coming from NMR, shape. You can simply do biochemical experiments or detect mutations uh, in, in evolutions or SNPs. Uh, uh, so genetic variation that might affect interactions. And if you have uh, nothing, you still have sequence and coevolution these days where you can make predictions about where the binding sites are and possibly predictions about which residue are interacting concerned with the co-evolution, basically a revolution that has led also to the success of Alpha Fold 2. So if you want to read a bit more about that, there's a number of reviews. Uh, so these are reviews that, uh, that uh, we have been uh, writing over the years. Uh, if you want to know what's the state of the art in, uh, in the docking field, you can look at the uh, special issues of proteins that are appearing every second, third years. Uh, based on the results of a blind uh, experiment, blind, where different groups are putting their software to the test, uh, Capri. Okay, so let's move now no more to the specifics of uh, ad hoc. So how do we do the modeling in ad hoc using information to guide the process? So ad hoc has been, uh, so you, you see here the original publication, which dates of 2003. So uh, it has been almost 20 years since we started developing uh, the concept of uh, information-driven docking or high ambiguity-driven docking, as you see here. So it started from NMR data initially, where we had information about binding sites, but we didn't know how the molecules were binding. And since uh, these original days, we have been extending the capabilities of ad hoc to deal with a large variety of, of information. So I think one of the power of ad hoc is that if you have information about important residues for the binding, surface information, uh, you can encode this information in some kind of energy function. I'm going to come back to that a little bit uh, and use this energy function to basically bias the sampling and also the scoring. And next to encoding any kind of, uh, say, surface-based information, you can also specify very specific distance restraints between specific uh, part of the, of the structure. This is not novel. This is what is done classically in NMR structure determination. Um, but Haddock was one of the first docking software basically allowing to specify, specify distances between atoms, which also has its advantages for small molecule docking, as you will see. Now, since the early days of ad hoc, uh, things have been evolving a lot. So currently uh, we can handle up to 20 different molecules. So we can build large macromolecular assemblies. Um, symmetry is another sort of uh, information that you can leverage for the docking process. So if we are modeling symmetrical assemblies, homomers, uh, you can impose the symmetry as another restraint, another energy function that you incorporate in your, in your sampling and scoring. We do allow for flexibility at the interfaces. So Hadoka has a flexible refinement stage, as you will see. And uh, we do also some uh, final refinement, adding solvent, although in the latest version of uh, Hadoka, we don't do that by default anymore. And we have 
constantly been uh, putting our software uh, to the test uh, by participating to Capri over the years and have uh, gotten very reasonable results, consistent results over the years. Now, how do we encode information? So I told you one of the, I think the key source of information is what we often have at hand is that we know that some residues are important for the interaction. So this could be a mutation. If you mutate residue X on the surface, the complex is not formed anymore. So we know that this residue is important for the binding, but we don't know what are the contacts that this residue is making. And we want to define some kind of energy functions that will force or this residue to be at the interface. And the way to do that is to use the concept of ambiguous interaction restraints or ambiguous distances. Uh, this is not a novel concept at the time. It was actually, this concept was introduced for NMR structure calculations by uh, Michael Nilges, where uh, we typically have ambiguity in the assignment of NMR signals and we have to deal with this ambiguity. But in the context of docking here, we, uh, we push this concept of ambiguous restraints to a much higher level. So you see an example of a complex. You have uh, protein A and protein B. And we have a number of amino acids that we have detected as being important for the interactions from some kind of experiments. So this will, will be the red one here. And we have a number of amino acids that we consider as a surface neighbors. Again, we don't usually detect the perfect interface. So we are missing information. We might have too much information. So we have to deal with that. So we increase a bit the definition of the interface by considering the surface neighbors typically. And what we want to do is to define some kind of energy functions that will force these residues to, be, to make contact with one of those guys on the other side without knowing which one of those should be the correct solution. And we do that by defining a distance restraint between this residue here and all residues at the other side. And this distance restraints um, is basically some kind of energy function that you see here. So it has an harmonic part. It is a flat bottom potential harmonic part, and then it becomes linear. Um, so this is a classical potential that we are using in NMR structure calculations. Again, this is the work of Michael Lynch's. And you see here all the functions. So it's zero if you are between the upper and lower uh, limits. It's harmonic if you are above the upper limit, and then it trans it goes to a, a linear function if you have above a given value s here. Now, for each amino acid that you have identified or predicted to be important for the interaction, we are going to define one such uh, energy function, such distance restraints. Now, the distance that we are uh, uh, input here because we don't know which distance it should be because there are all, all kinds of possibilities. So we calculate uh, an effective distance, which is the sum of all possible atom-atom combinations of distances between this residue here and all the residues on the other side. So we do this summation as one of the distance per six power. This is again coming from NMR. This is dipole-dipole interactions. But this is also the attractive part of a Leonard Jones potential to represent Van der Waals interactions. So you sum all those distances as one over R to the six, and then you take the inverse of this sum and the six roots, and this gives you one distance. And this is what enters this sum. Now, what are the limits that we are defining? We are using rather short upper limits of only two angstrom by default in Haddock. So we say this residue should be within two angstrom when I calculate this effective distance from the interface of the other molecule. Now, two angstrom is very short because it's shorter than the shortest distance between two carbon atoms, for example. But the property of this summation here is that this distance that comes out at the end is shorter than any distance that enters this summation and by quite a bit. And that's the reason why we can afford to use a upper limit, uh, which is very short, two angstrom. Now, I also mentioned that our, the data are often uh, not perfect. So we are dealing with false positive predictions or experimental data. So our way of dealing with that is to randomly delete part of the information for each docking trial that we are going to do. And by default, the server will delete 50% of the information. So it means that each model that we generate will be based on a subset of the input data and that we give to the software. So that's really the, the, the key behind the use of information in ad hoc.
Of course, if you know exactly which pairs of atoms should be in contact because you have a cross-linking data from mass spectrometry, you don't need to have these ambiguous restraints and you can define a very specific restraint in that case. So we have all the flexibility from highly ambiguous to very specific. So how do we search the space? So we have to search this say six dimensional space if the molecule were rigid. Uh, so we use for that uh, basically a classical search techniques based on a combination of energy minimization and molecular dynamic simulations. So it's gradient driven. So we calculate, we have an energy function, we calculate the forces and the forces are telling us basically where the system wants to move. So next to the experimental information or bioinformatic information that we put into the modeling process, we have our classical force field terms for molecular dynamics. We describe bonds between atom angles, rotations, and the non-bonded interactions. Now the protocol, uh, the docking protocol, the current docking protocol in HADOC consists of uh, three steps. In the initial step, the molecules are treated as rigid. And this is uh, initial docking by energy minimization. Then we're going to uh, heat up the system and introduce flexibility, but at the interface only to basically optimize the interface of the complex. And at the end, uh, the old protocol was solvating those molecules in water and performing a very, very, very short molecular dynamic simulation. So nothing with the, compared to say nanosecond micro semicond uh, molecular dynamic simulations. But we have to sample a large number of models. So it's also a time question. So this is a illustration of what happens in this rigid body minimization. So the molecules are uh, separated in space, randomly rotated separately, and then we turn on the minimization. And the minimization in this particular example is guided uh, by residues that were detected by NMR as being part of the interface. So this brings basically the interface together without predefining what the orientation between the molecules should be. Now, this phase we sample typically in the order of 10 to 100,000 different models. And then we apply a scoring function, I'm going to come back to that, select a fraction of those models, a few hundred, and then start uh, using molecular dynamics um, to optimize the interface. So you see here uh, this simulated aligning protocol. So you see flexibility is introduced first along the side chains. So you see side chain motions, and then in the second, last phase, we also allow the backbone to move and you saw that this loop here just flip over. So this is done in torsion angle space or so not Cartesian space. So the degrees of freedom are basically rotational on bonds. Uh, this which allows to uh, quite efficiently freeze part of the molecule without applying position restraints. So the molecule can move freely in space, but only the degrees of freedom that we want to sample are uh, allowed to, uh, are free to move basically. And these are rotations. First, the side chains and then the backbone. So this takes a bit more time than each stage. And then the final stage would be to solve it this in a, in a layer of water. So these are not paired with boundary conditions as you have heard of molecular dynamics and they were very short refinement. And by very short, the default protocol was a few tenths of picoseconds, okay? This is nothing. It's just change a little bit to optimize the energetic mainly of the interface but doesn't do much in terms of structure. So this is really peanuts, nothing like full-blown molecular dynamics. But if you have to do that for hundreds of models, you don't want to have to run you know, nanoseconds or microseconds simulations. So flexibility in this uh, modeling field is a challenge because if proteins or if molecules change a lot their conformation upon binding to their partner, it's very hard to, to predict such changes. So in HADOC, we have different levels of flexibility. So you can start the docking from ensembles of structure. So you can provide multiple conformations to the software. And that's usually the best way if you expect large conformational changes, it might be easier to try to pre-sample to generate ensemble of conformation prior to docking, um, rather than expect that the docking itself and the flexibility that we have, but also all the docking software offer can model very large conformational changes. We are very much still limited in what we can do in terms of large conformational changes. And the explicit stage is that we allow for side chain and backbone, but only at the interface typically to move during the refinement process. So again, the three stages and what appears here now are the energy functions that we use not to calculate the models, 
but uh, that we use to score the models. Because again, we might have 10 to 100,000 models here and a few hundred models at those stages. And at the end, you need to rank those models that the scoring part and the final um, scoring function uh, is seen here. So we have two terms that are based on the intermolecular energies, electrostatic and van der Waals energy. So this is the amount of energy between the molecules where we use 20% of the electrostatic energy and the full van der Waals uh, energy intermolecular. We have an empirical dissolvation energy term, which basically measure the bonus or the price that you have to pay when removing water from the interface. So if you bury hydrophobic surfaces, usually it's a bonus. If you bury charges, you have to pay a price to dissolve those charges. So this is this term. And the last term here will be the experimental information that we put in. So does the model fulfill the data that we had at hand? So that's uh, how ad hoc works. Now you can uh, get the software to run it locally, uh, but uh, it's a lot of computations that you're doing. So you need uh, uh, quite some resources to do this kind of computing. Uh, which is why we have developed uh, since uh, 2008 now uh, a web portal uh, where users can submit their data. And what you see here is the latest version of the portal based on ad hoc uh, version 2.4. So users submit the data and the computation will run on our site, either on clusters that we have uh, in the lab or uh, in most cases, this being uh, sent to uh, uh, grid resources distributed uh, mostly around Europe, but also around the world. We have access on paper to about 100,000 CPU cores. So this is high throughput computing. It's not high performance computing, which is maybe more the topic of this pre school. Of course, if you have access to a, a supercomputer, like the ones that Praise offers, you can uh, install a local version of the software and run things locally. I'm going to show you some, uh, some data on that. Uh, the server, however, does much more things for you than uh, the, the local version. So there's a lot of pre and post processing, which is done by the server, which you will have to do yourself manually if you run a local version. Now we have a large user base, slowly reaching 25,000 registered users from all over the world. And we have served more than 370,000 docking runs since the opening of the server in 2008. Um, more than 50% of those are, have run on these HTC resources. And uh, if we look at probably uh, the, the 2.4 server, it's probably more than 80% of all the computations have been done on high throughput computing resources. If you are interested in getting the software, visit bonvinlab.org slash software, where you will find all the information about Haddock. So this is uh, just uh, an overview of uh, the distribution of our users. So we have more than 120 countries represented uh, with a large community coming from uh, India, Europe aggregated, and the US and also China. Now, we have seen Last year, when the lockdown started, that uh, well, a lot of people could not do experimental works, labs were closed, uh, but they realized that you can still do computing. So if you have access to computing resources or if you have access to services like the Haddock server, you can still do research. And what you see here is the number of docking runs that the server is processing per month. And before the pandemic, we were at somewhere two and a half thousand docking runs per month. Um, and here you see the start of the lockdown, start of the pandemic, and you see a, a huge increase in the number of process jobs. So we almost triple in a few months. Uh, this kind of reflects the waves of the, of the virus also to some extent. So here in the summer, and here was the, the second wave coming uh, at the end of last year. And we also started monitoring actually the uh, the submission asking users to flag their submission as being COVID related or not. And since uh, April uh, 2020, we see that about one third of all submissions on average are related to COVID. So people are studying interactions of viral proteins with our receptors, but also doing uh, you know, drug design, drug repurposing using Haddock. Uh,
the back end of the portal to be able to accommodate these increased demands. Uh, we had more resources allocated during uh, at the start of, of the pandemic, uh, more sites giving us access to their resources to, to distribute those jobs. So and this is uh, thanks to a resource provided by EGI, the open, European Open Science Cloud, but also the Open Science Grid in the US. So all jobs are also crossing the Atlantic. They're also running in, uh, in Asia in some sites. Uh, getting access from the server to say HPC resources like Prez is much more complicated. Uh, there's quite a simple mechanism for us to distribute the job worldwide uh, to IHTC resources. Uh, it will be much more complex to funnel those to run on HPC uh, resources. But that's something that might happen in future. So some of the highlight I also mentioned, already mentioned that you know, we can go up to 20 molecules, which is not something uh, trivial. Uh, there are a few software that can uh, model very large assemblies. Uh, you see here one example, and we are not limited to protein or small molecule. We can mix and match. So we can have DNA, RNA, protein, small molecule. Um, so this was work uh, published already in 2017, but the server to, that goes with it was only came up live uh, later on. I didn't mention cryo electron, well, I did mention cryo electron microscopy as this fantastic method to generate uh, structures these days, but not all data in cryoEM will reach the atomistic resolution. So we will still have plenty of data which will have medium resolutions where you cannot build the structure from scratch into the density, but where you will have to model the component into the density. I uh, think also of cryo-electron tomography when you are looking doing, uh, say, electron microscopy of whole cells. Um, there you don't have the enough samples to generate often the high resolution uh, densities that you need to build a model from scratch. So when the resolution is still too limited to, to build complex from scratch, what you can do is to use the information to guide the docking process. And then now we are docking components of a complex into the density. And this is something that we are now supporting as well into ad hoc and was published uh, uh, quite some time ago, but is not part of the ad hoc 2.4 portal. Uh, in our efforts to move further to our larger and larger assemblies and to basically speed up the computations, we also have been building a course graining into ad hoc, implementing basically the Martini force field, uh, which is a, a one to four. So you have one bead representing four heavy atoms into ad hoc available from the server. So you can transform on the server your molecule from atomistic to coarse grain, do the modeling at the coarse grain level and the server will transform back the complexes at the end to an all atomistic level. And this is supported both for proteins and nucleic acids, but this will not work uh, for uh, small ligands, for example. Now I mentioned the computational challenge. I mentioned that Haddock is running, uh, the server is running in high throughput mode, not high performance mode. Um, but within the context of the BioXL project, we are working on uh, you know, making a uh, HADOC uh, very efficient on uh, HPC resources. But just to give you an idea, the server is sending more than 20 million jobs to those uh, distributed HPC resources. This is not a number that you would like to see on the HPC center. I think if you were to send 20 million jobs to the batch system of those HPC centers, the administrator would not be very amused which is why we are also uh, revisiting our way of running uh, the computations to run an HPC system in a much more efficient way. Um, you know, the challenge here are, are both, it's not only computing time, but it's also the amount of data and the amount of files that we are generating. When you run molecular dynamics, you might generate a very long trajectory file of your system, but it's one large file. When we do this modeling, we generate hundreds or hundred thousands of small files that represent all the models that we have. And this is also stressing the, uh, the file system. So we have to, to change the, the, the way we are doing things. Uh, so we have developed a pilot mechanism to run on HPC where, so instead of ad hoc sending jobs, we are sending ad hoc as one job to a full node. And each node will basically calculate one complex. And you see here a scaling plot where uh, this is the whole clock time in minutes to model 100 protein complexes. So if you do it on a, on a single node, uh, it takes you in the order of, uh, this will be 20 hours about. And as you increase the number of cores, you increase the number of nodes that you have access to. 
uh, you see that this is, is pretty much linear scaling. Okay, there is no communication between nodes because each node is handling one specific complex. And this is what you will need if you want to go to uh, interact on predictions to like model all possible complexes in a given organism. Now, Hydoc is one of the core software in the BioXL Center of Excellence. You probably heard already uh, today about the BioXL Center of Excellence. As part of that, we have a, a forum in BioXL at askbioxl.eu where you can find a lot of information. So if you have questions about uh, Hydoc usage, you run into problems, very likely uh, your question has already been answered in the forum. So you can search the forum for, for those answers. And if you can't, you can't find the answer, you can of course uh, post new questions there. And you can see that this is actually uh, used a lot, uh, quite a lot of protein, small molecule docking. We're going to come to that today, uh, dealing with dimers and all kinds of uh, other questions. Now, Haddock is not the only thing that uh, we are doing in my group. So we are uh, developing all kinds of software, all uh, centered around the topic of uh, uh, biomolecular interactions. So we have software to analyze data, like cross-thinking data. We have software to do predictions of interactions, of prediction of surface on protein. We have software and services with it. So these are all web portals, by the way, uh, related to predicting uh, the affinity between molecules because scoring in docking is not equal to predicting binding affinity. It's a different problem. Uh, and we have uh, developed other tools, for example, for fitting into EM map, and this provides input for Haddock again. So visit WeNMR Science UNL if you want to learn more. Now let's move to some application examples, illustrating what can you do with this kind of uh, techniques. And we will start with the modeling of protein-protein complexes. And the first example is an example of using basically NMR data to model a membrane complexes. By the way, if you think that Haddock is a fish, yes, Haddock is a fish, but when we uh, uh, chose a name for our software, we were thinking more of uh, this character here, which is Captain, Captain Haddock, uh, the big friend of Tintin, so European cartoon. So if you know Tintin, you should know Captain Haddock. In other part of the world, people might not be very aware of this, or so they think of fish, but no. When we think of Haddock, we think of Captain. And in this particular uh, work, we are actually uh, talking about iron piracy. So this representation of Haddock as a pirate is very uh, timely for this work because we are trying to understand and model a complex between a bacterial uh, receptor, which is basically sitting on the membrane of the bacteria and the soluble protein of the host, which carry an iron sulfur. And the bacteria for its survival need to hijack the iron from the host. And it does that by binding ferridoxin. Now, there's a large group of, uh, of researchers and different labs represented in this list of authors. So they are crystallographers, they are biochemists, they are membrane biochemists, and they are, we are in there as, as, as modelers more. And the problem was that they managed to get a beautiful crystal structure of this membrane protein, which is a two to force, where they saw actually all the loops of the system, but they never managed to co-crystallize the complex. So there was, there was no information on the complex. Well, the crystal structure itself does give us information because we know that this is sitting in a membrane. We know which part of the structure is extracellular. So the binding must occur in this region. So this is also information which we can use in Haddock. Now for ferredoxin, what was done is to look at ferredoxin, which is a small protein, and you see the iron sulfur here slightly in yellow. So it's a small protein, so you can look at it by NMR and characterize its binding to the receptor. Uh, it's a weak binding, meaning the, the binding affinity is rather weak, but by NMR, in those cases, you can map the surface, the region of the protein where the binding takes place by measuring um, changes in NMR signals, chemical shift perturbation experiments, basically. Now, if you measure the changes in a location of the signal and you plot those changes, it's basically a distance by how much does the signal shift in the experiment as a function of the sequence of amino acid of your protein, you see that those changes are in specific region of the protein. And if you map those changes on the 3D structure of your protein, you see that they define a well-defined interface. If you were to rotate this one, there is nothing on the backside. So this is where the action takes place. And this is typical information that 
that ad hoc can have us to guide the modeling process. So we're going to define those residues in the ad hoc concept as active, meaning that they should make contact with the receptor in the final models. Now on the receptor side, we cannot do the NMR, it's a membrane protein, it's more complicated, but we have this knowledge of which loops are the extracellular loop. So in ad hoc terms, we're going to define those as passive residues, meaning that they should ideally be in the interface, but if they are not, it's not penalizing you. For the active residues, if those are not at the interface in the final models, this is going to generate an energy, uh, which is penalizing the model. So this red region basically here has to sample somewhere on this green region. And this is the information that we give to ad hoc. And when you do that, uh, you typically get, get multiple solutions unless your data are really, really good. And maybe the system is so asymmetric that there's only unique solutions, but in general, you get multiple solutions and then you have to assess those solutions. Now in ad hoc, we use a scoring function to rank the solution and you see here two clusters. Uh, the first cluster has a score of minus 138 in this case, arbitrary unit, we don't put kcal per mole or whatever because it's a score and it's not a binding affinity. Uh, it's a large populated cluster, 150 members. The second cluster only has seven members, but you see that the score is very close. And actually, if you consider the standard deviations, the scores are calculated on the best four model of each cluster. So we calculate the score on the same number of models for each cluster. You cannot say that this solution is significantly better than this one. So we will need to validate those solutions in some way. And this is an important part of all the modeling uh, that we are doing in interactive modeling. So we need, the model is not the end of the road. The model is the start of new experiments. And if you were to pick residues that will allow you to distinguish those two solutions and make muta mutations, you might be able to answer the question of which one of those two clusters is the correct solution. Now let's move now to another class of protein, protein complexes. These are the antibody antigen complexes. Now antibodies, as uh, probably all of you know, uh, consist of two chain, a light chain, a heavy chain. And also uh, they cons each chain here has six loops, has three loops. And those six loops combined for the heavy and light chain are the basically um, create the region where the binding to the antigen uh, takes place. And those loops typically are in the maturation of antibodies, you know, immune systems. So this is where a lot of mutations take place to basically adapt the antibodies to re recognize a specific epitope on the antigen. So this is actually information, okay? We know where antibodies are binding their targets. So this is information that we can use in ad hoc to guide the modeling process. So this is the work of Francesco, a former PhD student in a group. So what we, uh, we wanted to test basically, uh, can we use this kind of information to guide the modeling process and how well is that doing? And we wanted to compare the performance of ad hoc to other software, which all allow in some way or other to use information about the binding uh, loop of antibodies to guide the modeling process. <clears throat> so these are Plus Pro available as a web server an excellent software which is doing very well and consistently in Capri, ZDoc, also a famous docking software, and LightDoc, a more recent software, integrative modeling, which uh, in which we added uh, the capability actually to use information to bias the, uh, both the sampling and the scoring. So in Clus Pro and ZDoc, the, the information that you have is used more for the scoring part while in LIDOC and HADOC, you can bias also the sampling using the information. Now we use a set of 16 antibody antigen complexes to basically uh, optimize the protocol and, and compare the software. So these are, uh, they are larger sets of antibody uh, antigen complexes. Recently, there were a new set released. <coughs> Excuse me. There was a new set released. Um, but these 16 complexes are basically complexes for which have not been used for the training of some of the software that we are using here. So what are we going to test? So we have three scenarios. Now the first scenario, which will basically be the best case scenario, we have a perfect definition of the residues that are part of the interface, both on the antigen and the antibody. So this is not a real life scenario, but this is basically the best information that you can get. Um, without getting specific contacts, just knowing what are the interface. 
The second scenario is a scenario where we say, okay, we have the knowledge of the, well, of the hyper viable loops on, on the antibody. And on the antigen, we have some loose definition of the epitope, epitope. So this is, for example, what HD exchange experiments could give you or NMR experiments. And in the third scenario, we only have the information on the loops on the antibody side and we have nothing on the antigen. So we don't know where the binding site is on the antigen. And for that, we're going to sample basically the entire surface of the antigen uh, during the docking process. So three scenarios, nothing on the antigen, loose definition of the binding site on the, on the antigen and perfect definition. And here are already the, the, the results of all the docking that we've been doing. So each column is a software, plus pro, ad hoc, light doc, and set doc. Each row is a scenario. No information on the binding side on the antigen, loose information, perfect information. So what you can already see is the more information we have, and this applies to all software, the better the docking results are. So that's uh, the first. Uh, if you have no information and you only have knowledge of the binding of the, of the loops on the antibody, you see that docking is not a simple problem or success rate is not fantastic. So what do we see here? So on the x-axis, you see the success rate defined on those 16 complex, um, considering the best model scored. So that will be T1, considering the best five, best 10, best 20, best 50, and best 100. The color coding tells you the quality of the model. So if you have dark green, it's a high quality model, say within one angstrom of the crystal structure. Light green is medium quality within two angstrom of the crystal structure, and blue will be acceptable quality within four angstrom of the crystal structure. And these are measures of RMSD measures calculated over the interfaces of the complexes. So you see that when we have, first of all, scoring is not so simple. Uh, but sampling also not. If you look at the T1 performance of all software, if you have no information on the antigen side, but you know the binding side on antibody, you know the success rates are pretty poor. 6%, 0, 6%. Haddock does better, 25% success rate, but it's only one out of four. Uh, if you look at the top 100 models that you generate, which is a lot of models to consider, uh, you see that uh, now we are reaching above 50%, so this is maybe 55% with ad hoc. Uh, the other software remains around 30, 40% for close pro and set doc. And like doc actually has quite a nice sampling, reaching 50, uh, reaching uh, almost 70% success rate, but it's one of the model in the 100 that you generate. So it's clearly, uh, they, there are still challenges to be solved here when you have very little information. But as soon as you have information, you see that all the software benefit from the information. We've had out reaching the best performance because you start seeing high quality model popping up. Uh, together with Close Pro, we reach about uh, say 45% success rate um, for the top one model. And if you consider the top five, we are now at 75%, which is the highest of all. Top 10 model, 10 we can still look at. Uh, it's 75%. And if you look at the top 100, we reach 100%, but you don't know which one of the 100 will be the correct one. So that's not so simple. Now, if the quality of your information increases, then you see that all software are doing very well, although the scoring still remain an issue. We've had our having now 100% success rate in the top one, but this is uh, say an artificial case where we have the perfect information about the interface. But I guess this should convince you that using information really pays off. It increased not only the number of models that are correct, but it also increased uh, the quality of the model and it increased the performance of the scoring, the detection of the correct model. Okay. So this was all published uh, last year in structure. So you can look up if you want to read all the details. So now small molecule drug design. So we have been also working since quite many years in uh, predicting small molecules. Uh, so using ad hoc for plotting small molecule docking. When you use the server, the server will automatically generate topologies and parameters for the small molecules. So it, it's simple to use in that, same, that sense. And we have been developing various ways of doing the docking over the years. And I'm going to show you the, the most recent uh, 
uh, most performing way of doing protein small molecule docking. Uh, some of this work has been actually uh, catalyzed by uh, participating to this D3R grant challenge, which is a basically a blind competition to predict protein small molecule uh, uh, ligand conformations. So the initial way uh, that, that we've been doing docking is uh, that uh, we have some knowledge of the binding site. And if you think of small molecule docking software like Autodoc or Dogovina, you have to define a box in which the sampling takes place. So you put basically a box on the binding site. It rarely happens that you do a fully blind docking against a, a, a protein. So all the small molecule, specific small molecule docking software ask you to define where the binding site is. So in ad hoc term, this will be defining as active residues, the, the, the region of the binding site. And then we define a restraint between the ligand and this binding site. So this was one of the first uh, way of doing docking. So you can read the detail. Uh, the performance at the end was not fantastic because uh, we, we realized that there are many uh, very specific aspects of small molecule locking. Selecting the template is very important, both for the receptor, the protein that you are targeting, but also for conformations of the ligand. So having learned from uh, the, the, let's say the, the problems that we encountered in our initial participation, we started uh, doing things in a much smarter way. Uh, first of all, uh, to deal with conformational changes, if you look at your protein targets, often you will find in a PDB uh, identical proteins that are bound to some other ligands. So selecting smartly the protein conformation that you're going to use for your screening is important. Then we have to generate conformations of the ligands because in all this, we, we often start from a small, small string, which is basically a one-dimensional string describing the, the ligands, the chemistry of your ligands. So we use in that particular work, open eye omega uh, to generate 3D conformations of the ligand up to 500 conformations. And then we compare all of those to the ligand which was found in the, uh, the template receptor. And we do a comparison both in terms of uh, sim say chemical similarity, but also uh, a shape similarity. So this is used using a shape Tika in open eyes. So we want to select conformations of the ligand that resemble the most the conformation of the template ligands. It's not the same, but it's a similar ligand that we identify in the PDB. And what we do then is we don't do docking. We superimpose basically the ligands onto the receptor. So it's a template-based modeling of protein-ligand interaction. And we use HADOC only as a refinement tool to remove the clashes. And this approach has been very successful in D3R uh, in the third and uh, fourth uh, competition in D3R. So basically, if you remember the three stage of HADOC, we only do the final refinement. And what you see here, it's probably difficult to see our, our predictions on top of the crystal structure, which is yellow. Uh, there are still cases where you, you see here there's a conformational changes. Well, we didn't capture that one because the refinement here is not going to introduce uh, large conformational changes but we did very well for this particular set of, of structure, which was D3R uh, round four in this case. And the most recent protocol, which has just been published in uh, GCIM, is to use actually shape restraints modeling uh, to guide the docking process. So what we do here is to, we identify again a template structure, which has a related ligand, and we have to select that smartly. So we want to find a ligand which resembles the most the ligand that we have to dock. We transform this ligand into a shape information. So you see here a shape. So these are dummy atoms that are in the receptor. They don't interact. They don't have any energetic contribution with the other molecule. And then we use the distance restraints in ad hoc to define restraints between the ligand that we have to dock and the shape. So what we effectively want is that the ligand overlaps with this shape. And this is what drives the docking. And we don't have to do any superimposition of the ligand prior to the docking. Uh, we don't need to do a smart selection of conformations. We can leave all the conformations to ad hoc and the distance restraints are going to guide the docking and also induce conformational changes. So we can do that just using the shape information or we can use that also using a pharmacophore model where we associate actually properties to the shape, to the bead atoms, like it should be, you know, uh, more uh, positively charged or negatively charged. It can be aromatic. So you can use these information to guide your modeling process. Uh, so if you want to know all the details, you can look at uh, that paper. So this is actually a protocol that we have been using last year. 
at the start of the lockdown to do some drug repurposing work against uh, uh, corona proteins. So what we did is to sample about 2,000 uh, approved small molecules. So we did some filter in size, a number of atoms, and uh, we did a screening against three uh, targets, uh, the main proteins of, uh, uh, of the virus, uh, RDRP, which is another target, and also uh, the or own receptor ACE2 in order to possibly prevent the binding of the spike protein. I'm going to show you some results for MPRO. Um, so we use this uh, template-based approach here to, to do this uh, entire uh, docking, this shape-based docking protocol. Uh, we could do the docking uh, on HTC resources at the time. So using again, this grid computing resource. So, so we sample all those 2000, uh, we did these 2000 docking runs in uh, three and a half days. Uh, running uh, uh, all over the place. So you see here a number of sites. So a lot of those sites are in Europe, but you also see the open science grid here. You see this is Beijing in China and some of the sites that gave us additional resources, especially to do this kind of work. And during that particular week here, so this is a week when we did this screening, you see about a quarter of all the submissions. So this is in the order of uh, 60,000 or 70,000 uh, submissions to these high throughput resources, a quarter of those were COVID related. And this gave us uh, a lot of, uh, I'll say, ranking of, of small molecule. Uh, a number of those have been experimentally tested. You see here our top two and top five molecule were confirmed to be micromolar binding uh, to the main protease. But the problem is that once you start doing cellular assays, uh, those compounds are also cytotoxic to cells. And in the context of a large uh, European project, there is a lot of this drug repurposing has been done and actually none of the approved drugs uh, is still in the pipeline because of different problems. So we, we are able to identify compounds that are able to bind as this is demonstrated here, but uh, generating a drug that you can use really uh, uh, is a different uh, challenge. With that, I want to finish. So I hope to have given you an overview of what uh, information-driven uh, modeling, integrative modeling can do in this field. I think a very important message that I'm giving every time is that uh, when you generate models, it's not the end of the road, but the model is just a start for new hypothesis and new experiments. So it's not a linear process, it's a circular process. You do some modeling, you do some experiments, you improve your model, you improve your experiments, and that makes you converge to the solution that you want to find. And in that way, integrative modeling and information driven modeling are very much complementary to classical structural methods. And if you look a bit in the future, uh, the protein database was 50 years old this year or is 50 years old this year. I think we are going to see more and more of integrative models. So you see all different experimental methods that are combined with uh, simulations, with integrative modeling, not only to try to capture a single state of a protein, but we're going to look at uh, what I call integrative structural biology of dynamical landscape, because the, 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 the state of molecule is going to change depending on what their function is, where they are in the cell, where they are in a cell cycle. So it's a dynamical landscape that we are looking at. And if you are doing this kind of integrative models, not so much for small molecule docking, but for say macromolecular assemblies, you can now deposit those in a PDB dev. They are not accepted in a protein database, but there is a repository to deposit those. With that, I want to finish thanking the group members that have, and this is a subset of the members that over the years have contributed to uh, every, all the developments around HADOC. Uh, and thank you very much to, uh, for your attention. So of course, we couldn't do all this work without funding from national and European agencies and by Excel having a huge contribution to all our developments from HADOC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. This was a really nice talk. Uh, there's a couple of questions at the moment in the chat. I encourage everybody to write your questions there if you have more. So the first one is, uh, have you done comparison between Haddock Gold and Autodoc? So in ways that they can be compared. Yeah. Yes. So in the actually in the shape based protocol that we have just published, uh, there is a comparison. Uh, a lot of the software are using the Dude E dataset, which is a benchmark for small molecule docking. Uh, and this is, until now, this was a 
bounds docking benchmark, meaning that you are taking, you have the structure of a complex, you take the molecular part and you just try to dock again. And this is of course a much easier problem because you don't have conformational changes. Um, and gold and autodoc and a number of those have been uh, tested on this duty benchmark, so we can compare those. And what we have shown in this paper, I don't have the figure right at hand, but again, go look the publication, is that our unbound performance, so the protocol starts from not the bond form of the receptor, but a template which resembles the bond form. And we start from small strings, so we don't have, we have to generate from scratch the conformation of the ligands. And this unbound docking using the shape protocol is competitive with this, uh, say, more commercial docking software or free like Gold and Autodoc, but with their bond performance. So we don't know what the unbound performance is of this software. And we, uh, in benchmarking, I think the, the, the groups developing the software should be doing the benchmarking and not groups that are not expert in the use of the software. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there's a question regarding uh, what's your definition of close when you talk about ranking clusters? Okay, close. So in the example I was showing, uh, if you compare the... So let's put up that slide here. So if you compare the score, so this one is minus 138, this one is minus 131 and the standard deviation is plus minus 20. So this cluster must contain a member which is better in score than this one. So basically what, what we would call close, you know, if the, if the cluster are overlapping within their standard deviations, then you cannot state that they are significantly, that one is significantly better than the other. So in any way, you should never, when you, you look at docking models, you should never look only at the first solution that the software gives you. And this is true for any software. You have to look at what are the other solutions. Are they very different? And try to, in the ideal case, you also have some data that you did not use in the modeling that you might use to actually uh, uh, discriminate between uh, clusters. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question. How do you deal with the cases of small molecules with missing stereochemistry data when using that e database or uh, open eye omega? So the benchmark that we did, I think they all had the stereochemistry uh, in the in the Jude uh, set that we used. Of course, if you don't have that, then uh, you know you you will have to generate uh, multiple uh, conformations, and that's going to be we never tested that but you will have to generate different uh, stereochemistry and this might become a combinatorial problem if there are multiple sites. So then you are in trouble and you will have to generate topologies for the different stereochemistries because you know, your improper definition might be different depending on the stereochemistry that you have. So you will have to repeat the docking for each stereochemistry, but that's not something that we have ever uh, dealt with, I must say. Mm -hmm. Protonation state I see appearing. So protonation state, it's an important aspect also in docking because you know when, when we do you think oh one mutation is killing a complex uh, it can change a charge by just uh, eliminating or adding one charge unit and, and the complex is not formed anymore uh, in most cases i think the, the residue that you have to worry about are the histidines um, and that's uh, so the way that we assign the protonation state by histidine well you can do it in different ways so you can do it manually uh, for the server, you can specify manually. If you don't do that manually, what the server does is to do an educated guess. So we use small probability reduce to generate all the idle chains and then select the, the state which is coming out of that. This is a bit the same of what Gromax is doing when trying to guess the protonation state of histidines. You can try to do uh, to run servers like probeka, and there are other tools where you can try to predict. Um, the PKAs, and then if you know the PKA at which the experiments or the, the, the binding is occurring, then you can figure out if your histidine should be protonated or not. It's rather rare that other residues like glutamate, aspartate will be protonated or not. So, but you, yeah, this is, a, this is something that you need to, to think about, especially if in your binding site, you have uh, charge residues. Mm -hmm. 
uh, unnatural amino acids. So we do have, uh, I can show you that in, a, in, a, in the demo slash tutorial. So we have a library of modified amino acids that we are supporting. Um, so we have phosphorylated ones, we have acetylated ones, methylated ones. Uh, so you can find that on the server online. And the dose on the server will also be supported by the local version of the software when you run it. Uh, to use those in ad hoc, you don't have per se to generate all the missing atoms because ad hoc will generate the missing atoms for you. But you should change the name of those amino acids to the nomenclature used by ad hoc so that ad hoc recognizes that this is a modified peptide. Uh, sometimes users come with questions, can you implement these particular modifications? Uh, if it's simple to do, uh, we do it. If it's complicated, then, uh, then, then it's usually not possible. Um, but you want to, uh, the, the thing is the unnatural amino acid, you could also define them as heteroatom for the modeling process, but then they will not be connected to the remaining of the peptide. So that's also some, that's not a very good way of doing things. Okay. Uh, there's no more questions at the moment. So uh, I suggest we take a break now until 3.30 when we are going to have a demonstration session. And uh, if you have other questions, then we can take them during the demonstration slot. I have just one uh, comment before you all run uh, to grab coffee or whatever you want to drink. Uh, so we have one hour for the demonstration, so I'm going to guide you. So we're going to use the web portal. In case you want uh, yourself to, uh, to try to follow, uh, it might be hard given the limited time, but if you want to play with the portal yourself, uh, you should try to register for access to the portal during the, the, the coffee break. Uh, I'm pasting the link in the chat. So if you are interested, try to register. You will get an easy level access to the server. For some of what we are going to do today, you will need guru access. So you can ask guru access if you have it. But again, it's not uh, uh, it's not really necessary for the for the time we have today. So you can also follow what I'm doing, illustrate. I will illustrate things, and we have uh, well documented tutorials online that you can follow on your own later on. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so uh, we'll meet again at three thirty. Very good.